Hello, good afternoon, good morning or good evening, everyone who is uh, joining us today. Um, this is our weekly COVID-19 live Q&A with um, Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove. Um, we apologize for being a little bit late than planned, but we have a special guest today who you will see at the end of our program. So stay tuned and stay with us. I'm sure uh, you'll love to see our special guest. Um, Mike, Maria, good afternoon. Um, thank you, especially Maria as well, who should have been spending some time with family, but still joining uh, to answer your questions about COVID-19 variants, epidemiological situation, and any, any other relevant questions. So if you're watching us on Twitter, please use the hashtag AskWHO. If you're watching us Facebook, on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, ask your questions via comment section. Um, my, um, we had the emergency committee last week, mm -hmm. uh, another emergency committee on, on COVID-19. So um, maybe we can start by um, summarizing what were the experts' recommendations for countries and WHO uh, to further reduce COVID-19 transmission and, and suffering. Well, maybe I'll start, um, before we get to the recommendations, maybe I'll just give a brief update on what we presented to the emergency committee. So we had our, I believe it was the eighth emergency committee meeting for COVID-19. Um, over the last 18 months, um, we bring together, the director general brings together um, the emergency committee every few months um, to provide them with an update of the global situation and look at the temporary recommendations that they issued the last time um, to make new ones. And so for this one, um, we, we typically start out the meeting by giving them an overview of, of the global situation. So we presented um, the EPI, you know, what are we actually seeing at a global level? Um, and we are, you know, as, as you know, Alex, as you've asked us many times, we're in a quite a dangerous situation, a challenging situation right now um, in the, at the present time. We're still seeing increases in cases and deaths uh, around the world, particularly at the global level, um, but also across many of the WHO regions. Um, and I can just give you a snapshot of that. In the last seven days, um, at the global level, there's been an 11.5% increase in cases in the last seven days. Um, and there was a 1% increase in deaths. Um, at the regional level, um, there's varying levels of, of increases. 20% um, increase, almost 21% increase in Europe in the last week. Um, a 16.5% increase in Southeast Asia. Uh, almost 30% increase in the Western Pacific in cases. A 15% increase in the Eastern Mediterranean reading region. We had a slight decrease in cases in the African region in the last seven days, but I will remind you that over the last several weeks, Africa has had a substantial increase. So it may seem like a slight decline, but they're still at a very high level. In terms of deaths, um, we've seen uh, increases in four of the six WHO regions in deaths, 10% uh, increase in the Western Pacific, uh, a 12% increase in Southeast Asia, um, a 4% increase in the Eastern Mediterranean region um, and slight decreases in the other regions. But again, in Africa, last week we had a 50% or 60% increase in deaths. So um, it's a very worrying situation um, 18 months in. So what we also presented to the emergency committee are the reasons, the factors um, that we believe are driving these trends. And there are four factors. The first are the virus variants. So the virus is evolving and it's continuing to evolve. We have four variants of concern that we're tracking. The latest is the Delta variant, uh, which has demonstrated increased transmissibility, even more so um, than the other variants of concern that are circulating. And that's happening in the context of increasing social mixing. This is the second factor, increasing social mixing and social mobility. And the third factor is the inappropriate use of public health and social measures, measures that are proven to reduce infections, uh, to prevent infections, to reduce the spread and to save lives. And the fourth challenge, uh, the fourth factor that we see is a highly susceptible global population um, because we have a really gross inequity of vaccine distribution worldwide. So the people that need vaccination the most are not receiving the vaccine. These are people who are of older age, um, are frontline workers. And so in the context of virus variants, increased social mobility, social mixing, um, inappropriate use of public health and social measures and inequitable vaccine distribution, we're in a very dangerous situation. Um, and it's becoming more and more challenging and, and we're moving further away from the end of this pandemic than we should be at this point in time. 
Um, and so we give this overview to the to the emergency committee members, um, and they we give them an opportunity to ask us questions. Um, and it's always a really uh, very good discussion uh, with them, and we're really grateful for all of our EC members. Um, and then they look and they make some recommendations. So maybe Mike, you want to you want to comment on on some of the recommendations? But a lot of them are around you know IHR um, and travel uh, and what the secretariat and WHO and what member states should be doing. Thank you, Maria. Good. Um, well, I think you covered a lot of this. Um, the, the committee itself really tried to reinforce. Uh, the need for countries to continue to use a kind of an evidence-based approach and focus on these, making sure that countries have this comprehensive approach using public health and social measures. And those of you out there know what that means. That's wearing the masks. That's having a uh, reduction in density of people in certain settings, uh, outside, inside, uh, etc. Physical distancing, hand hygiene, ventilation and ensuring the countries recognize that a vaccine-only approach is not enough. So they really tried to balance that. The other thing they really advised uh, WHO and, and, and governments on <coughs> was to continue taking a risk-based approach to mass gatherings, these huge gatherings around the world, religious gatherings, sports gatherings, not saying they shouldn't happen, but saying that governments really needed to invest <coughs> in how <coughs> they managed public health risks associated with those events. So reducing the risk of those events, becoming super spreading events. Uh, third area they really focused on was supporting the DG's call to accelerate vaccine distribution, particularly the call to get the 10% most vulnerable people in the world everywhere vaccinated uh, by the end of September 2021, and to increase that uh, out through the end of the year. Um, they also focused a lot on um, again, emphasizing again the need to continue surveillance, con continue to do strategic testing and tracing and quarantine. Um, they also wanted to ensure that um, we were taking the issue of um, uh, therapeutics seriously, not just vaccines, and that we were focused on ensuring that we were getting the recommended therapeutics out to all countries, including oxygen. Um, and uh, they did focus a little bit on travel and, uh, again, advising the countries use a risk-based approach, not these absolute travel bans, but understand the risks of travel, minimize those risks, and reduce travel when needed to essential, but then when travel is resumed, that that's done on a very careful uh, means. Uh, the committee also were quite clear that they did not advise uh, that countries should use proof of vaccination as a requirement for travel. Uh, and that is uh, based uh, mainly upon the fact that vaccine is not distributed equitably around the world. So to introduce such a requirement would effectively lock hundreds of millions, billions of people uh, inside their own countries. And uh, it emphasized that there were other criteria like testing and serology criteria that could be used to allow people to travel. So they were very, very clear that using vaccination as, the, as a single uh, means of uh, allowing travel was not really uh, acceptable to them and they advised against it. Uh, they also were advising that all countries should recognize all of the vaccines that have been um, uh, approved under the emergency use listing process of WHO. So again, making sure that all countries are recognizing what we have agreed globally as the approved vaccines. Um, and again, a final piece of advice to, to governments to continue on community engagement and management of misinformation and the infodemic. So uh, any of you who've heard this before, it's the same old, same old, but that's what it is, unfortunately. We've said it here before. We've got to double down on what we know works. Uh, and the committee said nothing from a perspective of that's surprising, um, uh, except to re-emphasize the fact that we have to get our act together, not just in vaccination, but in so many other areas in the coming weeks and months. And they were very concerned with this two-tier two -tier pandemic now, the pandemic of the haves and the have-nots, particularly when it comes to vaccine. Thank you very much both. Uh, um, we're already receiving follow-up questions. Um, Maria, one of our view viewers, Mary Beth, is asking um, if you maybe can highlight the epidemiological situation in Americas, because you, you didn't mention it. Um, I assume there may be some declines in the region because you're focusing on regions with increase. But just just to clarify for Mary, please. So thank you, Mary, uh, for the question. So at, at a at a regional level, um, in the last seven days, there was about a half a percent increase 
in cases in, in the last seven days and about a 5.6% decline in deaths. But if we look at this, if we break this down, there were almost 1 million cases reported in the Americas last week. Um, so that's not a small number. Um, it's, it's across a large number of countries um, and more than 22,000 deaths um, from 36 countries. Um, the total case number in the Americas represents more than a quarter of all global cases that were reported last week. So still quite far from over. 40% of deaths globally. And 40% mm -hmm. of deaths globally, mm -hmm. yes. So it's still a substantial burden um, across the Americas. And it's not just in North America or South America, it's across the entire, um, the entire region. Um, you know, in, in Brazil, there were almost 300,000 cases reported last week. In the U.S., more than 200,000 cases reported. I'm looking at our EPI update that we receive uh, every morning, and a, a big shout out to all of our EPI team, uh, our, our regional offices, our member states that provide this information so diligently so that we're actually able to look at this. Some of the concerns that we see, not just in the Americas, um, but in many regions, the Americas as well, is that some countries that seem to have reached that peak and you know are starting to decline are stuck. They're stuck at a really high level of intensity and they can't quite bring that transmission down. Um, and that's really worrying, again, given, given 18 months in, given that we have the tools at hand, that can bring transmission down to very low levels and we have vaccine. Um, and countries that have, that have the fortune to have access to vaccines and vaccinate a substantial portion of their population, starting with those who are most at risk, the older age groups um, and those uh, frontline workers, are starting to see declines in hospitalizations and are starting to see declines in deaths. So vaccines are incredibly effective against severe disease and death. So when it is your turn, please um, get the vaccine. Uh, and, and, you know, I know that many people around the world are so grateful for this, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of people around the world that don't even have the opportunity to be offered the vaccine. So think about that. You know, we need to think about this right now. Um, and it doesn't end when you get the vaccine. Um, and it is important, uh, you know, that people continue to adhere to the individual level measures that keep themselves safe, even if they're vaccinated. Because we, we know, while we know that vaccines are incredibly effective against severe disease and death, we don't have the full picture yet about infection and about transmission. So people who are vaccinated can be infected and they can pass the virus to others. It's not as common um, if you're unvaccinated, but this is why we, we continue to recommend wearing a mask, for example, uh, avoiding crowded spaces. The other issue in the Americas, um, as well as in many other regions, is that there are a number of countries that were very successful in keeping transmission really low, like almost you know, not being affected by it at all, and now are seeing really sharp spikes in transmission. Part of this is fueled by new variants of concern, but also because it is so difficult to keep up these public health and social measures. And I will say again, that public health and social measures does not mean lockdown. It's a combination of factors. So there's a quite worrying situation, you know, around, around the region, around the world. And for those of you that are thinking global level, you know, we try to give these short snapshots and I know my answers aren't very short, um, but there's very diverse situations on, on continents and some countries are the size of continents. And then we have island states, you know, that really depend on tourism and travel. Um, many countries in South America have had massive uh, peaks in transmission and are just starting to, to turn the corner there. Argentina, for example, turning the corner there. But they're all facing very, very difficult situations and they don't all have the tools. They don't have all of the tools at hand. Um, and so it's, it's, it's quite worrying, I have to say, uh, at a global level, at a regional level and in many countries. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. And just on the, oh, the Americas, I mean, I think the, the, the challenge in the Americas in general, is, as uh, Maria said, it's a vast region, goes from almost the south to the North Pole uh, and everywhere in between, with every possible social, economic, climate, and environmental variation that goes within. But the one thing I would say is that certainly Central and South America have now really been in the depths of this pandemic uh, with a huge pressure on the health system for a very long time. Really sustained, you were saying, a very sustained pressure on the system, on the population. Other areas have gone up and down and gone into periods of relative lows, but uh, it's been tough, and it's been tough on health workers and frontline workers 
in the Americas to, to be at the front line for such a sustained period of time, the population um, to be there. And if you look at the rates per 100,000 people in the last week, South America is still very much there um, uh, when you look at the actual incidence per 100,000. It's still up there uh, and growing again. Um, and again, this is the experience of a pandemic without high levels of vaccination. What we've seen in many, very much in North America, what we've seen in Europe is a decoupling of the incidents from the deaths, or at least for now. Uh, we'll talk later about what may happen next. But certainly in the countries that have achieved higher levels of vaccination, even if they've got increasing incidence of disease, the number of deaths has not grown at the same rate. So they've sort of, they've kind of delinked the number of cases from the number of deaths to an extent. In, in, in Central and South America, because of the absence of high levels of vaccination, that hasn't happened. Higher numbers of cases lead immediately to pressure on the health system, which lead immediately to higher rates of death, as we saw in India and Nepal and Indonesia and other countries. So what we're seeing is if you don't reach a minimum level of vaccination in the country, if you don't get your vulnerable people protected, when the virus comes, it does damage. It damages the health system, it damages people's health and potentially kills many. Uh, and that's why, you know, the Director General has been calling for to add to surveillance, to add to public health and social measures, to add to all we're doing. One of the pathways and the only real pathway out of the pandemic is to get that minimum number of people vaccinated in every single country. So we can, like Europe has done and like um, North America has done, de-link incidents from uh, the number of cases from the inevitability of the hospitals filling up and the inevitability of the graveyards filling up. And right now the only thing that helps make those things go uh, differently is vaccination. And it's good news, vaccines are working. They may not be working perfectly and we have seen cases of people who've been vaccinated who can still be infected and maybe even pass infection on to others. But what is absolutely clear is that double vaccinated people on average have a much less chance of going to hospital or dying. I mean, you know, absolutely minuscule chance compared to someone who is not vaccinated. So in a sense, the, the hospitalizations and the deaths are overwhelmingly happening in unvaccinated individuals. That's, that's the case. Um, and that's where I think we have to make progress, uh, Alex, is South America, Central America, and other places around the world need more vaccine if they're going to break this deadly cycle of cases leading inevitably to high levels of hospitalization and high levels of death. Thank you, Mike. And um, there are so many follow-up questions. I don't know even where to start. I'll try to go chronologically. Um, Mike, you mentioned on, on um, emergency committee recommendations regarding travel, and Maria also mentioned the importance of travel, especially for island states who depend on, on tourism. And one of our viewers was asking, will travel bans be lifted? Um, I know that countries are uh, putting different measures in place uh, to minimize the risk of uh, travel, um, bringing more infections, but maybe you can elaborate a bit more on what the, the committee recommending and also what is WHO recommendation on, on travels at the moment in time of uh, COVID-19? Um, we've put out more guidance on international travel in, in the last couple of weeks and, and that's very much been endorsed by the committee. Um, uh, first of all, WHO always tries to balance the public health measures which may affect travel and the need to keep and uh, not to interfere with normal travel and normal trade. It's a balance you have to strike. Like everything, uh, it's the same with the balance of opening schools or not opening schools, or opening workplace or not opening workplace. Everybody knows at this point there's no zero risk. Anything you do in this pandemic will either increase or decrease the risk. It, ver it rarely leaves it at, at zero. So if you open your schools, you do increase the risk, but if you do it safely, if you do it in a planned way, and if you have opened your schools in areas with low community incidence and you have good measures in place, yes, you can open your schools safely. It's the same with travel. Uh, travel is, is, in fact, to a great extent, travel has been de-risked. 
the process of travel now is so much that the testing processes and the separation process and the mask wearing and the cleaning is such that you may actually be sometimes safer in the airport and in the plane than you might be going uh, to the local bar or somewhere else, right? So a lot of effort has been put in by the airline companies and governments and the airport authorities to make the process of travel safe. And we believe that the process of travel can be made safe and is being made safe. The challenge is for the countries receiving people from other countries. What are the increased risks? So if people come to my country, does my risk increase? If I have a low incidence country, if I have no cases of COVID-19, then every person who arrives from my country potentially could bring uh, cases. So I'm going to be very strict. If I've got a, a large outbreak in my country, then maybe uh, people coming from a, a country with lower incidence than mine is not actually going to increase risk. So I balance the economic benefit of allowing the travel versus the risk that bringing the traveler to my country uh, introduces. And that's what we do in life. You balance those risks. So some countries, for example, like island states, are hugely dependent on tourism. But at the same time, very many of the island states have managed to avoid the worst of the pandemic and kept their numbers low. So how do they balance this? We need the travelers to come in order to generate income for our population. But if the travelers come, they may bring the virus. Now, how do they ensure to keep the chances of the virus coming to the minimum while maximizing the travel and the trade that they need to keep their society uh, moving? And the only people in it, we can't make those decisions from Geneva. It's impossible at a global level to decide what's best for St. Kitts and Nevis or what's best for, for, for uh, Fiji or what's best for Papua New Guinea or what's best for South Africa. Only sovereign governments can look at their situation their population, their socioeconomic situation, their local disease incidents, and decide how they're going to manage travel as part of the overall package. But as I said, everything you do in a pandemic either increases or decreases risk. There's no zero risk. It's about minimizing the risk. We believe a lot of travel can be managed safely. But again, if you go in a country from 10% normal travel and you go overnight to 100% travel, then our advice is always to start slowly, open up slowly, open travel up slowly, take it step by step, and see if that affects your situation positively or negatively, and then adjust as needed. I think what we've seen in this pandemic across a lot of these areas is um, big decisions to move quickly around lifting restrictions have almost always led to difficulties. We saw it last summer. Everything opened up, everyone moved around Europe, and by September we were back in another, in another big wave. Uh, coming up to Christmas last year, same thing. Everything opened up, and by January we were all back in lockdown. So I think our overall experience is lifting restrictions of any kind too quickly very often leads to negative consequences. But that doesn't mean, and again, WHO is not here to be the party pooper. We're here to give uh, measured advice, to say, do it slowly, measure as you do it, ensure that if you're opening up your travel, if you're opening up arrivals in your country, that you're doing it safely, you have the adequate testing regimes in place, you have adequate uh, quarantine um, arrangements in place, that you, um, you may want your tourists to come, but you may not open your nightclubs. You know, you might say, well, we'll, we'll have tourists come, we will open our restaurants outside because we're a sunny place. We won't have indoor dining. We won't open the nightclubs, but we'll bring people to our hotels. We'll bring people in order. So you can find a halfway house. But if you bring everyone that you brought two years ago and you end up with a fully packed resort and your everything is open, then if there is disease, then it's going to spread. And then you have to accept the risks that come with that. So everything is about how much risk are you willing to bear uh, in order to control the disease or, or to manage your economy. Our view has always been that if you let the disease out of control, that will ultimately damage your economy. So it's not either or. This idea that it's about the economy and we should protect the economy, therefore it doesn't matter what happens to COVID. I think many countries tried to make that decision a year ago and it backfired. Because it's very clear to me, unless you get your way out of COVID, your economy doesn't get its way out of trouble. Um, so, and I really feel for those countries, uh, and particularly those small island states who are very dependent on tourist income.
And for those of you out there who, you know, who aren't aware of that, there are many, many economies around the world, small economies, that are hugely dependent on the income brought in by tourism. And we fully understand that in those situations, those governments have to make choices that on the outside may not appear uh, to be driven uh, purely uh, by epidemiology or by the pandemic, but sometimes they're not in a position to make another choice because they're, they're genuinely trying to balance the social and economic stability of their country with the epidemiologic situation. And that is not always easy, particularly where your whole economy is depending on having those tourists. So, but our advice is always do it with your eyes open. Please don't do it with your eyes closed. Do it with your eyes open. Recognize the risk and say, if we're doing this, then we're bringing risk. How are we going to manage that extra risk? We're making an economic decision, but we can still manage the risk. We can still reduce that risk to some acceptable level. And I think it's when people do things blindly and quickly, and they use the excuse to say, oh, it's about the economy, therefore we have to just open up. I think that can be sometimes silly, because you're using the economic argument to just make rash decisions and it shouldn't be you can use the economic argument it is very valid and it's valid both in money terms and it's valid socially because you're trying to protect people's livelihoods and that's an important aspect of governance and government's responsibility but don't use it as an excuse if you decide you have to do things like that then try to manage the risks that come with it and do that with eyes open can I, sorry, sorry I've gone on a bit there, but I think it's... I, I think it's really important, too, because, I mean, we're, we live in the Northern Hemisphere, and we're in Europe right now, and it's the summer months, and there are many, many people traveling. Um, and as Mike has said, there's, there's ways that the, that the travel industry has taken to de-risk that. I would just like to emphasize that you, as a traveler, have a responsibility as well. So there are measures that are put in place. First of all, you know, ask yourself, do you need to travel? I still think in the, in the acute phase of this pandemic, we need to at least pause and ask that question. And the answer to many is no, um, but the answer to others is yes. You know, they need to see a sick loved one they haven't seen in 18 months or however long that may be, or they need to travel. Um, but there are a lot of people that are finding ways to travel, you know, in the countries that they live in, in the areas that they live in. There are many people that can't afford to travel. I mean, this is a, um, you know, a high income problem right now. Uh, quite frankly. Um, and I do think that those who are traveling need to take responsibility for how they travel. If they're asked to wear a mask through traveling, wear that mask, you know, keep carry your, your hand gel with you, you know, take all of those precautions as you go through that stage of leaving your house to entering into that other country, that other place that you live. And when you're in that country, act responsibly. Um, so there are measures that, in pl that are in place, adhere to those measures still you know, be smart, play it safe. You can still enjoy a holiday, but, you know, eating outdoors versus indoors, you know, avoiding the indoor crowded spaces. Um, the virus travels in people. And so, you know, you could be infected in the place that you are traveling. You have a responsibility to keep yourself safe, keep those who you're traveling with safe, and also, you know, um, not to bring it, bring the virus around with you. So I think there's a lot that people can do. And, and industry um, is doing their best to get the society back open, but we as individuals also need to do what we can to minimize that risk. It isn't a free-for-all. There is no free-for-all, there is no zero risk right now. Um, and I think that, you know, don't travel if you're feeling unwell, first and foremost. You know, stay home if you're unwell, get a test, seek medical help, um, and then follow the rules. You know, there are rules that are in place and many are trying to open this up incrementally, as Mike was saying, to try to do this not all or nothing. Um, and we, as individuals, have a role to play to try to keep it as safe as, as possible. But I still ask, you know, do you need to travel right now? We ask ourselves the same question. You, my family, we're having the same conversation and, and we're finding a way to do something just us so that we can have a little bit of a break. Um, but these are questions, unfortunately, that we're still gonna have to ask as we, as we make it through this pandemic. Thank you. Uh, just oh. be, there's, um, not, it's, it's, it's linked, but I think it's important. There are so many different celebrations going on at the moment, yeah. and I think tomorrow uh, Eid al-Adha mm -hmm. will start for, for for hundreds of millions of, of Muslims around the world, and that's the festival of sacrifice, I believe, that, that it is. Um, and it's really, really important. Uh, you know, Muslim families and friends unite around the world. They pray together to give alms. Um, and uh, this is the second time 
that families are going to have to celebrate this in the current restrictions. So I just hope and we um, we want to try and keep Adel at, uh, as safe as possible. We've issued uh, guidance on that with our regional office in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and just wishing everyone a very safe celebration um, this year. I know the, the Hajj in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has been curtailed to uh, residents of the of KSA um, and only 60,000 pilgrims this year and I know that's another huge sacrifice that the Muslim community around the world have had to make so we wish everyone Eid Mubarak and we um, just hope again as an example people will celebrate but celebrate safely. Thank you both. Uh, we've got again more follow-up questions but maybe just one on travel so that we can switch on other questions. Um, does WHO have any recommendations on airline companies on how to ensure their passengers and their clients are, are safe during the travel? I think there's a, we could go into the details here but there's a tremendous amount has been done by the um, the uh, ICAO, the International Civil Aviation uh, Organization with WHO with the uh, International Air Travel Association, which is the Association of Travel Airlines. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also done a huge amount of work with the International Maritime Organization because we've got hundreds of thousands of seafarers around the world um, who deserve huge credit because they kept the whole system globally running. Many of them didn't get to see their families for over a year. Um, and so there are different ways people travel, so it's not just airlines. And we'd like to thank those companies both the airports authorities uh, and the airline companies and uh, and the the shipping companies and others who've worked so hard to try and keep their staff safe but also to keep the travelers safe there's a tremendous amount of guidance mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. and uh, we've seen a lot of compliance from the travel industry around this yes they push because they want to get things open and there's always uh, a, a dynamic tension there um, and we understand that but they've they've always been very open to implementing uh, the best measures because they want to keep their clients their 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 their, their, their business is depending on keeping people safe and travel is something that and safe travel is something that the industry mm -hmm. both the shipping and the airline industry the train industry and others they pride themselves on safety so they see themselves as leaders in safety and i believe they have tried um and their best in that. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, and it's tough for people to keep up the idea of you know uh, disinfection in planes and people you know limiting their movement around the plane, especially on long haul flights and wearing masks and doing all the checks beforehand and the extra lines and the time and only one only has to be in an airport with kids and whatever and realize just how stressful travel can be and you add in all of these extra measures and it's it's tough. It's not easy. But uh, we believe the industry is working to, 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 has always been one of the first to pick up on these measures. It hasn't obviously liked a lot of the measures and it pushes back. Uh, but I do believe there's been a very functional relationship between the travel industry and ourselves and at national level between the travel industry and individual uh, governments. But we've issued guidance together. We've worked hard together to try and make this work. It's not easy for anybody. Uh, and I think, as Maria said, I think the travel process itself has been significantly de-risked. A lot of risk management measures in place. Now it's going to be hard if we look at over the summer, you see airports filling up now and you can feel um, the density of passengers and the number of people on the plane and the number of people in the airports and on the buses is growing. Mm -hmm. And the real question was, will then travel remain safe at these higher volumes and higher densities and higher occupancies uh, and that remains to be seen. So it's really important that the industry continues to implement the measures and as Maria said that people also bear their own responsibility. The measures are there for a reason, they're there to protect you and protect others. So if the, if the, if the regulation says wear a mask on the plane, you wear the mask. Um, so. Um, um, I, I suppose there's no real answer to the question. Uh, the details are there. We've issued lots of guidance. Uh, but we are pleased that the industry has been a strong partner. And I mean not just the airline industry, but the airports uh, associations, the, uh, the representative agency for seafarers and others. Uh, there's been a very deep collaboration over the last year and a half. 
Thank you, Mike. Um, I think these were all the questions regarding the travel. So I'm going back to variance related questions. Oh, and Maria, that's her. <laughs> here is one for you. Adam variance. Um, I think this was a second question we received. So it was a, a while ago. Uh, is the Lambda variant worse, worse than uh, the Delta variant? So maybe you can clarify the difference and also update us on, on both variants. Okay, so yes, so the Lambda variant um, is a variant of interest that WHO is tracking at a global level. Um, it was classified as a variant of interest in June, in mid-June. Um, it was first uh, reported from Peru in December 2020, so it's a relatively young uh, variant, uh, if you will. Um, of course, they're not alive, um, but it was, it was detected uh, relatively recently. Um, and it's circulating in a number of countries, um, primarily in the Americas, although it has been detected in more than 30 countries so far. What we do when we're tracking these variants is we're looking at their transmissibility, we're looking at if there's any change in severity or any impact on our countermeasures, like the public health and social measures or therapeutics, vaccines, diagnostics. Um, and so far we haven't seen that, any change in the Lambda variant. So it very much remains a variant of interest that we're tracking. And what we've seen is that there's only a few thousand sequences um, of the Lambda variant that have been reporting, reported in the public platforms like GISAID. Um, and so what we've seen is that in countries that have detected it, it hasn't really taken off in, in many of those countries. In some countries in, in the Americas, it is circulating. Um, but the Delta variant, the Alpha variant, the variants of concern are outcompeting um, the Lambda variant, for example. So it, it is one to watch. Um, it is one that we are working with our virus evolution working group on. Um, we're working with our member states, you know, to, to receive any information that we can on that. So we're we're keeping a very close eye on the Lambda variant. And you wanted you asked about the Delta variant as well. So the Delta variant is the latest variant of interest um, that we are tracking again at the global level. Um, and there is definitely uh, increased transmissibility uh, with the Delta variant. We're trying to better understand why, the reasons why Delta is more uh, transmissible. We don't have the full picture yet of this. We do know that some of the mutations um, that are identified in this uh, particular variant, for example, I'm only giving one example because there's many mutations identified in the Delta variant, um, for example, will allow the virus to adhere to the cell uh, more readily, more easily, and therefore infect the individual um, easier. We are working with a number of our technical networks to really look at the incubation period of the Delta variant, to look at the exposures that are being reported, um, because we know exposure that results in infection um, relates to a number of different factors. It isn't just um, a time. You know, many people say, how long does it take for me to be in the presence of an infected person to get, it, to get myself infected or for me to be infected? Um, but it depends on the setting. Um, it depends on the type of exposure that you have. It depends on if I'm literally spewing or spitting um, infectious particles at you. If we're in an indoor setting that has poor ventilation, um, you know, there's a lot of combination of factors. Or if I'm in front of you in a closed setting for hours upon hours. So what we're looking at is in the context of Delta, can we bring together all of the information that we have on transmission and see if there are any changes? Um, and if so, what does that mean for the recommendations that we have? Um, so the Delta variant is more transmissible. We have in two countries um, re uh, data suggesting that there is an increased risk of hospitalization. Um, but within those countries, we have not seen that translate into increased severity, increased death. Um, but we're still waiting to, to learn more because as you know, if somebody is hospitalized, it may take some time for them to reach their outcome, whether they recover or whether they um, succumb to infection, whether they die. But right now, we have not seen Delta translate into a higher case fatality rate, meaning the number of people that are infected with Delta don't die more often than other variants. But again, I should say at the present time, the virus continues to change. Um, you know, we're tracking at least two sublineages of Delta right now, the AY1 and the AY2. Um, and so there can be changes that will continue and render it more severe. Um, and so this is what we worry about, Alex. What we worry about are the changes. And so for now, the Delta variant um, is more transmissible. Our diagnostics work. The public health and social measures work. Although given that it has increased transmissibility, 
they need to be more stringent, they need, need to be more strictly used and perhaps for a longer period of time. Again, that does not mean lockdown. Um, it means a combination of approaches. Our vaccines work against the Delta variant in terms of severe disease and death. This is also critically important, um, but I should say so far. So um, this is really dynamic situation and it's, it's day to day. It's, it's literally, literally day to day. Um, and we have meetings every single day with partners, with regions, with countries, trying to gather more information on this. So if we can emphasize as much as possible, the best solution to this is driving transmission down, is to prevent people from getting infected in the first place. Because the more it circulates, the more it will change. And it's changing. The Delta variant will not be the last variant of concern that you hear us talking about. Um, we hope to put, you know, to have, you know, the conditions in place where it becomes the last, but I'm afraid, Alex, it probably won't be. And it's not meant to scare people. It's just meant to say there's a lot we can do. So we really yeah, need to do that. The thing with the variants, and they've kind of, the, f the variants will come along almost like a playbook because there's a distinct advantage for a new virus if it's more transmissible because it just infects more people and it becomes the dominant strain. So it's an evolutionary, there's an evolutionary pressure on the virus to be better than the other viruses. Mm -hmm. Like we see in, with normal evolution uh, in the biologic world. There's no particular pressure on the virus to become more severe. Mm -hmm. And in fact, most viruses, it's a bad thing because you don't want to kill your host, you want to reproduce and go on to the next host. So there is real evolutionary pressure we're seeing towards developing more transmissible uh, variants, but as Maria said, the longer that process continues, the greater the chance that just randomly um, uh, the virus will also develop a more virulent or more severe form. So in other words, going along with that evolution, if another variant were to emerge that was more transmissible and just happened to have at the same time changes that made it more virulent or more severe, we'd be in real trouble. Now we're not there because the evolutionary pressure is towards transmissibility, not towards severity. But that severity thing or that extra severity can come at any moment because it's a random process. Uh, so we're, 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 uh, we're, I don't know what they call one-armed bandits. We're at the, we're at the lottery and we're, we're, we're pulling that, uh, that arm and uh, uh, taking a risk each time. So. It's important that people are reassured that it is mainly a pressure towards um, a evolutionary pressure towards being more transmissible, and very often to be milder. That's often been the case in the past. But there is nothing to say that it can't turn, and we get a more transmissible variant that is also more severe. And that's uh, um, not something we want. It's not something we predict. But we need to be aware that that is always a possibility, and we can't just assume, as many people are, particularly in the northern hemisphere that this is all over. Uh, it's not. No. Can, I, can I just, I want to comment on what Mike just said about the lottery. I mean, this is not a lottery we want to be playing. <laughs> it is not a gamble that we should be playing right now. Um, and as I mentioned previously, the, the Delta variant, in the context of a highly susceptible global population, because we are not receiving the vaccinations that we need in all countries, in the context of increased social mobility, social mixing, where people are congregating more and in the absence of public health and social measures, that is a really deadly lottery that we're playing right now. Thank you, Maria. Here is a, a, a follow-up question. What is the Delta spread rate in vaccinated people? I mean, you were explaining what's the situation with the variant, but do we have any, any data on? So this, this is a great question. So we know that most people who are, are uh, being reported as being infected, uh, people who are hospitalized, people who are dying, are largely among unvaccinated people. Um, this is not to say that somebody who has received both of their doses can uh, be infected, as we said earlier, um, but this is predominantly happening, uh, happening amongst people who are not vaccinated. Um, and remember, most of the world is not vaccinated, and the Delta variant is in more than 107, uh, 111 countries right now. Um, and that's at least 111 countries because we are limited by our ability to do sequencing um, in all countries around the world. So it's likely um, if it's not already, it will become the dominant strain circulating uh, globally. Um, and so if you are unvaccinated um, and you are you know, partaking in risky behavior, you're not following the measures, you're not vaccinated, it will spread. Um, you know, we still, you know, the virus right now is still in control of us. 
Um, but we do have those tools at hand to, to keep ourselves safe. So I don't want people out there to think that there's this deadly variant that's out there and they have, they're completely defenseless against it. That's not the case at all. There are so many measures that people can, can take you know, to keep themselves safe. So I, I do want to make sure that that message is heard clearly. Thank you, Maria. Speaking of, of measures, one of our LinkedIn viewers is saying people who took the vaccine are no longer wearing masks. Isn't that still increasing risks? And then there was another question as well uh, from another viewer. Uh, why are there different guidance on mask wearing for vaccinating people, for vaccinated people? Yeah, so we our current recommendations are even if you are vaccinated and fully vaccinated, um, we still recommend wearing a mask uh, when you're in the presence of others, particularly when you're indoors, um, because we don't have the full picture yet on vaccine and infection and vaccine and transmission. We have great data in clinical trials as well as real world settings on the reduction in severity and hospitalization and death, but we don't yet have the full picture on transmission. There's very good indication that the vaccine works against infection and transmission as well, but people can still be infected and they can transmit. So this is why we continue to recommend wearing a mask, you know, ha good hand hygiene, avoiding crowded spaces, making sure that there's good ventilation um, when you're indoors. If you can spend more time outdoors than indoors, you know, keep your distance. So again, it's this all, there is no all or nothing. There is no one size fits all, but we recommend a comprehensive approach um, because all of these different interventions add layers of protection. Um, and so if you can, these are simple measures, continue to wear a mask. Masks are readily available right now. Um, and there's very good guidance out on fabric masks, three layers of a fabric mask, making sure you have the right filtration, making sure you cover your nose and your mouth. Wearing a mask under your chin is really not helping anyone. Um, it's a simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. So we, we continue to recommend that. And, you know, again, um, if we just talk about ourselves as WHO, um, you know that Alex here in the building and as WHO as a whole, even the fact that very many people, because we're in Switzerland, are double vaccinated, we haven't changed the basic uh, process. Mm -hmm. People still fill out an electronic questionnaire every morning before they come to work with symptoms and temperature. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. take their temperature, they come to work, we've got temperature check on arrival, even though, you know, temperature check is not the end of the, d the day, there's a second check. Uh, we still have uh, mask wearing in, in common areas, we still have the same density of meat, we've, you know, we, we're still applying the same basic um, limits to the number of people in, a, in any given room, we still have maintained the same level of work uh, of workers allowed in the building at any one time. So we've tried, even though that the vaccination rates have increased, we've tried to maintain uh, the same basic measures as before in order to keep that incidence as absolutely low as possible. Um, recognizing that people in their daily lives outside the workplace, outside our workplace, are now in a country that's increasingly opening up. We want to try and maintain the best possible preventive measures we can. So it's not that we're saying one thing and doing another. We're actually doing what we're saying and advising and trying to maintain those basic measures uh, because they do help, uh, they don't harm, and they will help. Um, and the idea that we get to a certain level of vaccination and then we throw open all these restrictions, uh, we don't believe is the prudent thing to do at this time. So I think it's really important that people also in workplaces, schools and everything, that we try and maintain the basic measures to reduce risk at all times. Um. Thank you. Here is a last question before we bring in our special guest. Uh, Brian Tobin is asking you, Maria, do we need to protect unvaccinated children and maintain higher vigilance for our youth? Oh, thank you, Brian, for the question. Um, we, we need to protect all children. Um, uh, as we do everyone around the world. So um, we do know, and we've known this from the beginning of this pandemic, that children can be infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, as well as any of the variants that are circulating. Um, luckily, still, um, the children that are infected tend to have asymptomatic infection, meaning that they don't have any symptoms or they have a mild, mild disease. Um, it's not universal though. You know, there are children who have been infected, um, particularly children with underlying conditions, but not always, um, that have had severe disease. You know, they've ended up in ICU and some children have died. 
So we do need to make sure that we keep keep our children safe. Um, but it's all the measures that we, we recommend, you know, for us, uh, for adults, uh, in, in making sure that we keep our distance, you know, we do our hand hygiene, and, and we make sure that the environments that we're in um, also provide safe environments. And so there are many, you know, schools that, that have opened, that have taken a risk-based measures um, to open up their schools and keep their schools open, um, because school is not only critical, absolutely critical for children's education, but also for their well-being. Um, for their security, for their safety. In many parts of the world, this is where children receive their meals for the day. Um, and so yes, you know, we must do everything that we can to keep us safe. You hear me say this a lot, to keep us safe, but also keep us from transmitting to others. And that also includes our kids. Thank you, Maria. And speaking of children, I am very, very pleased to invite our special guest, Cole Vankerkov. Hello. Hello, Cole. How are you? Uh, Thank you so much for finding the time to join us today. Maybe you can share with us what was the hardest thing for you during this pandemic? It's been a long time. Well, the hardest thing for the pandemic has been being separated from my mom when she came back from China. That was very difficult that you did couldn't give a hug to your mom, right? Yeah, yes. it was very difficult. Thank you, and we're sorry that you had to be separated from your mom and that she actually has to work so much and spends a lo lot more time with us than with you, including today. So we are grateful for all her time that you give to us. So I'll, I'll give the floor to you now, because um, you give us your mom. Now I give you the floor to ask any question that you would like to ask uh, your mom or Dr. Dr. Uncle Mike Ryan. <laughs> um, I don't really mind which one of you answers, but I wanted to ask, when do you think COVID will be over? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna try not to cry, I wasn't gonna cry. I don't know, honey, I wish I knew. Um, maybe Mike, you can okay. take this I one. I will start. Yeah, we have been asked this question before, Paul, and it's good one. This is what I want to know the answer to uh, as well. Uh, the problem is, uh, like everything in life, especially as a medic, uh, you're always supposed to be, be honest with your patients. And when they ask you a question, you're supposed to give them an honest answer. And the honest answer is, I don't know. Um, just like you don't know. Yeah. I know it'll end a lot quicker if we do the right things. It's a bit like, I know it'll, it'll end sooner if we give vaccines uh, a better chance to be used all over the world. I know it'll end sooner if we all protect ourselves and protect others. I know it'll end sooner um, when our hospitals are stronger and able to give better care. I know it'll end sooner. And you put all those sooners together, then maybe it's sooner rather than later. Um, and that's, that's our great hope. Um, but we're fighting uh, your mom does it every day, we try to do it every day to make the world a little fairer, uh, to share these things we have. I mean, it's amazing for you. You're, I'm sure you're, you look like a guy who'd be into science. I mean, in a year, we've developed some of the most amazing vaccines. Never been done on the planet before. We've just amazing technology, brilliant scientists who've developed these interventions that are just groundbreaking. Um, so there's great hope because we have, we have great brains and we have great minds and we can innovate and we can do things quickly, more quickly than we could ever do in the past. But our problem is sharing those fairly and ensuring that everyone gets access to the benefits of that um, uh, research and the, be the benefit of that uh, thinking and innovation. And that's what we're working at very hard right now. So if we can do that, and Dr. Tedros is really pushing the world to say, let's share. Let's share yeah. data, let's share vaccines, let's share the solutions, and let's show the solidarity for each other. Let's uh, help each other. I think if we do that, it will end sooner. Um, I'd love to say it will end this year, but I, I really don't think so. If we're really lucky, we'll have it under control next year. Um, for you and others who are lucky enough to live in countries that have high vaccination rates, it'll probably end sooner for you. Um, uh, and you shouldn't uh, be guilty for that. You, if you live in a country that's able to, to, to has the resources to be able to deal with this, then, then fine. Uh, kids should feel good about that. But we should also think about those kids that live in countries that don't have that. And kids can be big advocates. Kids should be asking their governments. You should be asking 
everyone. So why aren't we sharing? Because uh, that's uh, that for me is the big problem we have right now. We're not sharing enough. We're not uh, we're not being fair. And we know we learned that in school. One of the first things we learn is how to <laughs> share and how to be fair, right? Yeah. Uh, and then the adults tell the kids to share and be fair, and then yeah. we go and we're unfair and we don't share. Is that's not a really good thing, is it? If you're if the if the older people tell you to do something and then they do something different, <laughs> that's not really not that's really fair. cool. So anyway, that that's what I think. Old, but uh, I, I was telling before I have a poster on my wall because it really bad time last year. Uh, we were really under pressure, and it was just brutal here. It was really terrible, and we were very, very demotivated. And I got a poster one morning. Maria arrived in. She said, "Cole sent you something," and it was a poster, and it had a rainbow on it and the sun, and it had "Good job," and it's still in my office on the wall. It is the only poster on my wall. Is Cole's poster, so I've never got a chance to say thank you in public, Cole. But it You're meant welcome. a lot to me. <laughs> You're welcome. And if I could just say, I mean, I think, I think, you know. Cole has been very brave this year because it's been a tough year. And I know it's not just my kids that have had a tough year. Um, you know, Mike's kids have had a tough year. All kids that haven't seen their parents a lot this year. Um, it's been very difficult and he's been very brave. Um, and he's helped me a lot. So the poster that Mike just mentioned is in a lot of people's offices yes. here in I the building. I got one as well. Thank Alex. you so much. <laughs> Alex has one, and I have one, and I have a, a few other drawings, and he's also made us some stress balls. Um, mm, mine actually <laughs> succumbed to the stress. <laughs> <laughs> which also help, but have burst on a number of people. We need more. <laughs> we need more. But he's been very brave, and, and I think, you know, we, we know how hard it's been on kids on this, and you're helping us get through it. So we don't have an answer of how quickly this pandemic is going to end. But with your help, with your brother's help, with your daddy's help, um, with the kids all over the world, we can get that much closer to the mm -hmm. end of it. And I think the other thing is that we've we've sort of figured out a, a way of figuring out how to navigate through this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody wants to go back to quote unquote normal, but I think we've found a new normal here. Um, the hours are long for work, and I'm not always home every weekend, although I'm getting a little bit better. But I am taking a couple of days off, and we're gonna we're gonna spend some time together, and we're figuring this out. And so I'm grateful to you, and I'm grateful to all of the kids that are out there that have this understanding, um, and you know resilience, and you know this is your world, so you're gonna have to sort all of these big problems out when you get bigger. Right now, you get to be a kid, and that's just fine. Mm. Okay, but um, I love you. Love you too. Was this a Maria good said, answer? Maria said something about the dads and mums and guardians who've been with kids mm -hmm. while others have been able to go to work and work as frontline workers, as doctors and nurses, as Maria has. And they're real heroes too, because they've had to absorb a lot of the responsibility. They've got to take care of everything at home and create that space for those of us who have to work like we're working. So we should also remember those are the ones who really kept things going. And you mentioned Dr. Uncle Mike. I have to say something because um, there's a very special person who's currently in hospital um, uh, Amal uh, Bisharo Abdi Rahman Mahmoud, who's the daughter of, of one of our dear colleagues, Abdi, and Amal is in hospital at the moment. And uh, as you know, she calls me Doctor Uncle Mike. So to Amal, get well soon, Amal. We we send her all our supports really to have a swift recovery, and hopefully we'll be able to hear from her once. Yeah, yeah once maybe she's Abdi better. will bring her. Absolutely. That would be cool. Uh, you're invited, Amal. Get well. I think we need a new <laughs> guest here. <laughs> yeah. um, Cole, I, I hope that you are happy with the answer that you got. Mm -hmm. I'm, I must say that a lot of our viewers were sending comments in support of your question. They really loved your question. So I'll share more co all these comments with your mom later so she can read for you or you can read yourself. Thank you so much for your time. And again, thank you for giving us your mom's time. And as your mom said, thanks to all other kids for all the sacrifice and, and uh, resistance, uh, resilience that they, they are having during this difficult time. Um, I hope uh, they are also an example of how we can do this better and how we can stay vigilant and um, keep with all the measures we need to, we need to keep. Um, please, for any information more, Follow our website, our social media channels, and stay safe and talk to you next week.